Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Slept on Sports podcast, the podcast that takes interesting, lesser-known sports stories, stories you could say have been slept on, and brings them back into the light. I'm your host, Connor Grohl, and today I am joined by Ashton Pollard, a good friend, a Medill grad student, along with myself, a Notre Dame superfan, and the host of the tremendously entertaining college football podcast, Fourth and Four. I feel like this has been a long time coming, Ashton. How are you doing? I'm good. Hey, Connor. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, no, I'm excited. I've, I've listened to many episodes with our other grad student friends of Slept On Sports. So I'm excited to be here and tell this random story that I've come up with. So <laughs> that is, that's the whole point. So I'm very happy. That yeah, exactly. Here. Yeah, I will say that sometimes when I do these with guests, I don't know what they're going to say ahead of time. We don't really know each other's stories. This time we do. And I'm so excited for your story. It's going to be fantastic. I'm going to take the lead on this one, though. And I'm going to ask you a question first off. I'm guessing before yesterday, you had not heard the name Jim Devlin before. No, never in my life. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting probably everyone in our audience, you know, no one would have heard of this man. And one major reason for that is because he passed away 138 years ago. <laughs> so yeah, he's not exactly the guy that your dad is telling you stories about. Or um, your grandfather. Or, or your great-grandfather. Grandfather. <laughs> exactly. You got to go much down the line. And frankly, if people in your family that you know are baseball fans back in the 1870s, that is incredibly impressive. Um, I can't say I have anyone like that in my family, I, to I my knowledge. Exactly. I don't think I do either. But this story dates back to basically the start of professional baseball. The first professional league was the National Association, which began in 1871. This is just a bit of a background. So in 1873, a 23-year-old named Jim Devlin joins his hometown team, the Philadelphia White Stockings, and he primarily starts his career playing first base. In 1874, he moves to the Chicago White Stockings, and then by 1875, he starts his career as a pitcher. Before then, he'd been playing mostly first base, some outfield, some shortstop. But in 1875, he takes his first crack at being a pitcher, and he appears in 28 games. He makes 24 starts. He does okay. But 1875 is the last year of the National Association. So it dissolves, but then some of the teams from the National Association get together and they form the National League, which obviously still exists to this day. So that's in 1876, at which point Jim Devlin joins the Louisville Grays for the first season of the National League. So that's basically our background. But something important to note, especially for people that might not be huge baseball fans, is that in modern baseball, an NLB starting rotation is usually made up of five pitchers, right? Obviously, we're concerned about you know the health of the pitcher and their arm, and you really can't pitch every day. So they have a rotation of five pitchers. Basically, once every five games, each one of these pitchers will start the game. Now, back in the, I guess this is the 19th century, and really the early 20th century, you know, we didn't necessarily always have these five-man rotations. A lot of times people had, you know, three or four starting pitchers. Like in 1875, uh, Jim Devlin was one of three pitchers for the White Stockings that year. But the unique part about the Louisville Grays is that in 1876 and 1877, and this is really where the story kicks in, Jim Devlin is the only pitcher on the team. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand it. I still don't understand it. I'm going to try to put it in some type of context. But Jim Devlin is the only pitcher on this team. It's insane. So first we go to 1876. The Louisville Grays play 69 games. And of those 69 games, Jim Devlin makes 68 starts and tosses 66 complete games. Who made the last start? So yes. Here's Some random position player that we pulled in? Essentially, there were a couple guys on the team that had minor pitching experience um, in, in prior years that they just brought in. But Jim Devlin starts 68 games. And here's what's crazy. On the season, the Louisville Grays, their final record is 30 and 36, which if you're counting, that adds up to 66 games displayed on the team's record. And he makes 68 starts. And the reason why this is even possible is because in the early days of baseball, every now and again, 
either due to usually lighting or weather, games would occasionally be called as ties. So although the Grays officially played in 69 games, three of them were ties, leading them to have a 30 and 36 record. But overall in the year, Jim Devlin pitches 622 innings. There were three other guys on the team that each made one appearance as a pitcher, pitching a combined 22 innings. So Jim Devlin pitches in 68 games, and then three other dudes come in one time. He is effectively their only pitcher for the entire season. So I'm curious, like, and forgive my ignorance, are they playing nine inning games? Like, are these... Yeah. Right, so the so the it, it all matches up with how we currently play. It's not like he was pitching five innings like a normal start. I mean, it would still be absurd to pitch that much, anyways. But like his sixty six complete games are nine innings. Oh yes. So this is a great That's question. Ridiculous. So he pitches six hundred and twenty two total innings. So that works out to him pitching about nine point one innings per appearance, which is about what you'd expect. He's pitching complete games, and then occasionally he's pitching like an extra inning or two. So yeah, no, he's going the full game every time, just about, which is insane. Jeez. Do you have a pitch count by chance? I wish we did. Uh, I don't think we have the full pitch counts for all of those earlier seasons, but we do know that in 1876, he faced 2,568 batters, which is just a, <laughs> just a comical number. It makes absolutely no sense to me. But if you'll note, I said that in 1876, he effectively pitched every game for this team. And I say effectively because in 1877, the year afterwards, he literally did. That season, the Louisville Grays play in 61 games and Jim Devlin throws every single pitch of the entire season, (laughs) right? In 1876, for whatever reasons, you know, a couple times, you know, he gets relief from some random guy on the team. But in 1877, I don't know, maybe he's upset with himself for being weak in the prior season. He couldn't go. He won 99%, but he couldn't go the full 100. And in 1877, he makes it his goal that he's going to throw every single pitch for the team for the entire season. And he does. So he throws all 559 innings of 61 games. In total, he faces 2,328 batters. And the rest of the team does not throw a single pitch. The team's actually pretty good. They go 35 and 25, second in the National League. Uh, Okay. Yeah, it's not bad. I was going to say, I'm looking right now at leaders for innings pitch in the history of Major League Baseball, and they have it split between American and National League. This is like a quick glance. Nobody's gone over like 270 since like 1990, and nobody's gone over 300 since the early 70s. So the fact that this man is pitching 622 and 559 innings is double what anyone's pitched in the last like 60 years yeah exactly and for reference also like in 2019 which is our last kind of like full season justin verlander pitched 223 innings and that yeah. was all of baseball 223 and jim devlin back-to-back years 622 and 559 some of these stats especially with pitchers you know back in the 19th century that they were able to produce just don't even make sense with the concept of like what baseball is in the modern day. We were talking about this again yesterday. And the obvious question, which you brought up is just like, how does his arm not fall off? Right? Exactly. Yes. I'm wondering. So, I mean, to preface this, like, again, I I think there's no way he's doing this fully sober, right? Like there has to be some kind of, yeah, he can't be also, is he throwing like 90, hundred miles an hour? Like, is he tossing the ball? I assume like probably not, but I I mean, this isn't like, I would like some explanation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I look, I don't know the full miles per hours, but like, this is not, this is professional baseball. This is not home run derby. I'm like lobbing them up there for you. I mean, it's definitely not home run derby in the sense that in his entire career, he allowed seven home runs. That is some dead ball wow. era numbers. <laughs> for, he wow, actually, this man is good. Yeah, he actually holds the MLB record for home runs allowed per nine innings, which on baseballreference.com, because the number is actually so low, it's just listed as 0.0. <laughs> I was going to say, what is it, like 0.007? Like, yeah, like not a math wizard, but it's got to be pretty small. It's it's incredibly low. It's That sounds close enough to me. Yeah, just insanity. So 
What will help us to understand this just a little bit is that these days in Major League Baseball, teams play at least six days a week, it feels like, you know, sometimes seven days a week. And so that wasn't exactly the case back then. They were playing about every two and a half days in the 1876 and 77 seasons where he's throwing every day, which again, makes it a little better, but still, you know, no rest. Some of these games, they'll take like a week or two off to go on like a road trip. And then sometimes they'll play like three games in a row or something like we're accustomed to now. But what he's doing still feels absurd. It seems impossible. Yeah, it'd be like your like mid game relievers who put pitch one every like two or three days ish. Like, yeah, like every even for like the relievers, they'll go every couple of days yeah. for like two innings. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So he's going every couple of days for a whole game. For a whole game. And right. And now in the modern, yeah, and we think these guys can pitch two innings, but then we need to like preserve their arms, right? And then the starters yeah. throw like six innings and then they need four days of rest because we need to preserve the arm. Exactly. I'm I'm a Braves fan who their bullpen's struggling. And so I'm like cringing at the thought of the Braves bullpen, like anybody starting every single game. Yeah. Uh, but conversely, if you just had like one good dude, you just throw that there every time. That's fair. Yeah. This is this is only part of the story, right? He is pitching every single game of 1876 and 1877, just about. In 1877, literally every pitch. That's the only time one player has thrown every pitch for a team in a season in MLB history. That's only part of the story because 1877 is Jim Devlin's last season as a professional baseball player. Now, how does this happen? So in 1877, in August, the Louisville Grays are 27 and 13. I told you he had a good season. They're 27 and 13. They're leading the National League. They then proceed to go on a road trip where they have nine straight winless games, eight losses and a tie. And for a team that was 27 and 13 to lose eight games in a row, it's raising some eyebrows. There are also a few other things that are raising some eyebrows. Namely, that people that went to the games were confused by some of the boneheaded plays that the Louisville Grays were making and the uncharacteristically poor pitching from Jim Devlin. Adding to these rumors are the facts that apparently some members of the Grays were seen around town wearing fancy jewelry and dining at exclusive restaurants. So sudden affluence. So it's like your Alabama recruit showing up with a new uh, Mercedes or a Dodge Charger or take your pick depending on the school. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> something, something is not right. That's all the people yes. can figure out. And then, hey, we're journalists. So then the Louisville Courier Journal does some investigative work and they find that infielder Al Nichols has been receiving a lot of telegrams recently, which I find hilarious. Just the concept of like the telegram, <laughs> the telegram, FOIA, FOIA, everyone's telegrams. This is, this is effectively what happens. Um, That's hilarious. So yeah. So apparently the vice president of the Louisville Grays is a man named Charles Chase who had been told during this road trip that a surprising number of bets had been coming in against the Louisville Grays, but he basically just disregards this information. As one does. Yeah. Um, but then obviously with everything happening, them losing all the games, playing poorly, all the jewelry, all the telegrams, he's like, okay, okay. Maybe, maybe this is worth looking into. So he basically tells the team that, Guys, I need to inspect your telegrams. <laughs> <laughs> privacy, massive privacy concern here. Yeah, yeah. Privacy, we're throwing it out the window. This is the sanctity of the National League. And we need to... <laughs> In its third year of existence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So You can't let this institution just crumble falter like this. Yeah. No. So he decides, guys, everyone needs to show me your telegrams. What ends up happening is Jim Devlin and, and George Hall, who is kind of the main slugger on this team, they both admit, okay, we've been taking money to throw games. The telegrams also reveal that Al Nichols, again, the guy that had been receiving all the telegrams, had been receiving information about bets, and he's in on it. He also admits to it. So these three guys have all admitted to effectively throwing games. And then there's this fourth guy, a shortstop named Bill Craver, who refuses to show his telegrams. 
but he is presumed guilty because he had previously been caught throwing games in 1870 in like an amateur league. <laughs> so they have a known. This is yeah. incredible. Yeah. So they have a known crooked player on the team, and they just they just assume that he's in on it. Yeah. Seems uh seems not not how this is supposed to work, but that's beside the point. Yeah. I mean, it's not like surprising like he probably was in on it but well, no you know, it's you know. it's more it's more just like we have we have nothing to prove this but oh, we're exactly. doing it anyway no they have no evidence <laughs> yeah yeah the legal system has been thrown out the window again this is the national league we need we must yes. take this matter seriously That's um true. so then william holbert who is the president of the national league he bans all four of these guys who are either suspected or confirmed to be throwing games he bans them all for life and Bill Craver, the man who has refused to show his telegrams, is irate. <laughs> I mean, he's been he's been show crazy. your telegrams, Bill. Yeah, yeah. So maybe if he had shown the telegrams, things would be different. But Bill, I mean, he's really he's a good guy with privacy concerns, right? Fair. This so debate has continued to this day. <laughs> exactly. Bill was before his time. Exactly. So Bill is thrown in with a lot, and they are all banned for life from the National League. Unsurprisingly, following this 1877 season, the Louisville Grays fold. They will never play baseball again. They lost half their team, and they lost their only pitcher. Yeah, they lost their only pitcher. So, this is a great point. Who would pitch the ball? We have no idea. It's true. We don't know. So, effectively, the rest of this story, it, it, get, it gets quite sad at this point. Every year for the rest of his life, Jim Devlin appeals for reinstatement to the National League, and every year he is turned down. It's a shame. It's, 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 it truly is a shame. What's even more of a shame is apparently he gets so desperate that one year he goes to William Hulbert, still the president of the National League, and he begs on his knees for forgiveness and to rejoin the National League. William Hulbert says that he respects Jim Devlin as a man, gives him $50, but says, Jim, you have disgraced the National League and we cannot have that. <laughs> but here's 50 bucks. But here's 50 bucks, which like in today's money is roughly $1,000, which again, we've gone back and forth on. It, it's, it's generous. It's a lot of money, but it's also like not a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I know we're living in a time where people are making like 30 million bucks a year, Bryce Harper, but uh, yeah. at this is just still does not really seem like that much money, a thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Poor Jim. Yeah, and really poor Jim because how this story ends is he goes back to his hometown of Philadelphia, he becomes a police officer, and then a few years later, he gets tuberculosis and he passes away at the age of thirty-four. Really, you hate to see it. And unfor- yeah, you hate to see it. It's an unfortunate end to the Jim Devlin story. But yeah, that's basically the story of Jim Devlin. He is one of, honestly, one of the great pitchers in early baseball history. And he has this ridiculous career where he throws just about every pitch for his team in the 1876 and 1877 seasons. But then obviously this is kind of the first big professional baseball cheating scandal where he gets thrown out along with three of his teammates. And despite his appeals to get reinstated to the National League, it never ends up happening. There will be more, obviously, cheating scandals in baseball down the line, but this was probably a pretty important precedent to set, given how in the early days of amateur leagues, illegal gambling and throwing of games was something that was relatively common. So it's kind of unfortunate that Jim Devlin becomes a victim of this. I mean, I guess I don't really want to call him a victim, but I kind of want to know in 1878, 1879, 1880, if he keeps pitching, like, will he just throw like every pitch for like the rest of his life? Like, it's a funny thing to think about. Yeah, no, and it's uh, not surprising that it only took a few years for a scandal like this to come out in baseball. And then, yeah, like you said, they've continued since then for the last 150 years. But kind of poor Jim, but also kind of not because you kind of did it to yourself. Obviously, getting like TB like is sad and dying at 34, he didn't serve that. But like, I don't know. Yeah, I would have liked to see if he could if he could go like 10 years throwing 600 innings a year. That's one of those things exactly awesome. that, that we will never get to see in modern baseball. But it's like one of those things that you, you know, you kind of think in your head, like how many games can one man throw before his arm literally falls off? 
And yeah. like, it's a nice thing to think about, but it's also something that like in the 19th century, we that's something that we could actually have found out because that's just how it was back then. You will throw every pitch. And there was a lot of thoughts back then that if you pulled yourself out of a game, it would be like a sign of weakness. Yeah. But that is the story of Jim Devlin, the man who, I mean, really, he threw enough pitches that his arm could have fallen off, but it didn't. But we will never get to see the true limits of what Jim Devlin could do. No, it's a shame, really. Unfortunate, but slept on. And that's why we're here. But yes, exactly. now it brings us to the part of the episode that I'm so excited to hear about. Obviously, you're the college football expert, so no surprise that you brought a college football story to the table. But Yeah, yeah, I'm predictable. This is, this is just about the most ridiculous game I've ever heard of. So I, I'm very excited to hear you talk about it. Okay, so we are talking about the Bahamas Bowl, and I'll get into a couple of more recent ones, but I wanted to start with the inaugural one. The first Bahamas Bowl was played in 2014 on Christmas Eve. It To start, just like to set the scene, because the scene of this bowl is ridiculous, independent of the game. So this game is played at Thomas Robinson Stadium, which was a 2011 gift to the Bahamas from the Chinese government as part of their One Belt, One Road initiative. If you are not familiar with it, it's basically like an infrastructure and development strategy that the Chinese government is using to gain favor amongst smaller countries. It's kind of similar to like a Cold War domino theory type of gain the favor of as many countries as you possibly can because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So they essentially are giving out these infrastructure projects to a lot of countries and this football stadium which is actually a track stadium because they don't really play football in the Bahamas, was a gift from them. My favorite part amenity in the stadium is that the Nassau DMV is in there. So you can go enjoy a game while you renew your license. Although I don't know that it was open on Christmas Eve. Maybe it was open till noon. Anyone went to the DMV to renew their license and then there just happened to be a football game. (laughs) I think that that's probably true based on some of the reviews I have read of this game, but we can get there. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was open till noon. So it's like, go renew your license in the morning, go watch this game in the afternoon. I don't know. Anyways, that's ridiculous. But this specific 2014 game was sponsored by Popeyes. There are a grand total of zero Popeyes on this island. So not really sure why that was the sponsor, but I, I love Popeyes. It's delicious. So whatever. This game was played between Central Michigan, who at the time was coached by Dan Enos, who has essentially coached everywhere else in America since 2014 as an assistant. He's been at Arkansas, Michigan, Alabama, Miami, Cincinnati, and now is the offensive coordinator at Maryland. And then the other team was Western Kentucky, who was coached by Jeff Brom, who, if you're a college football fan, you probably know is currently the head coach at Purdue. There was an elite crew calling this game. Steve Levy was doing play-by-play. And then the color was done by Lou Holtz and Mark May, who, if you watch ESPN in like the late 2000s, you know that they like actively hate each other. (laughs) And then Laura Rutledge was doing sideline. She's come a long way from this event. (laughs) This is an incredible group of people. It really is. This is an incredible story in general. Like already at the beginning, our outset is we are playing a football game in a country that basically doesn't know anything about football in what is kind of, but like not really a football stadium. Their title sponsor is Popeyes. There are no Popeyes in the country. And by the way, I think Western Kentucky would probably be pretty angry that it's not the KFC ball. True. Very true. And also there is a DMV in the stadium. Yes. And the so DMV. now that we have set the scene for this game, we will get into the absurdity that is the actual game. First quarter ends, it's 21-7 Western Kentucky. Western Kentucky has 229 yards of offense in the first quarter, which is wild. But like looking at the score, you're like, okay, whatever, 21-7. That's not like a ridiculous score. Second quarter happens. It ends, Western Kentucky's up 42-14. They have 441 yards in the first half. And Brandon Dowdy, their quarterback, has 350 passing yards with five touchdowns, all of which went to different receivers. Central Michigan has 259 yards of total offense. So, like, 
it's not like they can't move the ball. They just really can't score. So again, we go into the third quarter. It is 42, 14 Western Kentucky scores a touchdown with eight 55 to go in the third quarter. So now there's approximately eight minutes left. It's 49, 14 Western Kentucky. No one scores for the rest of the fourth quarter. I mean, the rest of the third quarter. Yeah. 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 Fourth quarter starts. Central Michigan scores a couple of touchdowns with 11.37 left and 8.03 left. So we have eight minutes left in the game. It's 49.28. And you're kind of thinking like, all right, there's a little momentum that Central Michigan has, but like, there's no way. This quarter started, it was 49.14. This game was over. This feels more like respectable loss territory than like. Exactly. And like, yeah. And like Western Kentucky just kind of, gave up because it's a bowl game. It doesn't really matter. They were up by a ton. They're in the Bahamas. They don't really care. After Central Michigan scores, Western Kentucky gets the ball back. Dowdy throws a 56-yard pass to one of his receivers, and he fumbles the ball. Central Michigan recovers the ball on their own 27-yard line. They score on an approximately three-minute touchdown drive. So now we're at like five minutes left. It's 49.35. But again, we have five minutes. Like there's still no way this is going to happen. It still feels like there's not enough time. But at the same point, if that receiver doesn't fumble the ball, like the game is just over. Exactly. Exactly. Because then it would have been 56.28. So Central Michigan's down 14. Western Kentucky goes three and out. Central Michigan scores another touchdown in 51 seconds. So now it is a one possession game. Western Kentucky gets the ball back with like two minutes left. They go three and out again. Central Michigan gets the ball back with one second left at their own 25 because the punt bounced into the end zone. It was actually very poorly fielded, but that's beside the point. So they get the ball back with one second left, right? So you're thinking, all right, Hail Mary, Again, nobody really cares because this is the Bahamas Bowl. Like, nothing's riding on this game. It doesn't matter. So Cooper Rush, who is the Central Michigan quarterback, throws a 48-yard pass to Jesse Kroll, one of his wide receivers, who then laterals the ball to Deion Butler, who then runs for 10 yards. He then laterals the ball to Courtney Williams, who runs for two yards. And if you watch this video back, he's, like, swarmed with defenders. Like, there's no way he's getting out of there. Somehow – Throws the ball back again to Titus Davis, who runs 15 yards, barely questionably, I guess, gets across the pylon. Like when I first watched it, I was like, is this really a touchdown? But it was. So Titus Davis scores. So it is 49 48 Western Kentucky. It's pure insanity. <laughs> and Danny <laughs> knows it's kind of like, screw it, whatever, we're going for two. This doesn't matter. Like, he said, basically, he like went into the huddle with his team and was like, y'all want to go win this game? And everyone, of course, was like, yeah, 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 whatever. So they go for two. They do not get it. The pass is broken up in the back corner of the end zone. And Western Kentucky wins 49-48. So to recap that, there were five touchdowns in the last 11 minutes and 37 seconds scored by Central Michigan. Three of them were scored in the last three minutes and six seconds. The spread was Western Kentucky was either it was giving 3.5 or 2.5, depending on where you looked. I saw both in several different places, but clearly they didn't cover. So if you had money on this, this uh, you probably weren't thrilled. The the 35 point fourth quarter lead could not cover the three. Yeah, exactly. And this game ended with a grand total of 12 passing touchdowns and 971 passing yards, both of which were FBS two team bowl records. So this game was absurd. The setting was absurd. The Bahamas Bowl in general is just absurd. And this was a fabulous inaugural Bahamas Bowl in 2014. Yeah, there's so much about this that is incredible. But I think this is actually the perfect ending for a game like this. Because It really is. I mean, A, when you, when you score the five touchdowns in a row in the fourth quarter, like, you're not going to not go for the win, right? Like, you yeah. have to feel, like, unstoppable. Yeah, exactly. No, like we're not playing to tie this game, clearly. I also thought it was funny because that last touchdown pass from Cooper Rush that was lateral to four different guys, they called it the relay lateral because it's in the Bahamas. So it's like the Bahamian (laughs) relay because it's four guys, which is just 
iconically good. Great name. Yeah, this is a play I need to check out immediately. It's really, it's 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 quite good. And um, at some level, God. like, no one's happy by the end of it, right? Because <laughs> it's like, no. for one team, you know, a Western Kentucky, they've blown a 35-point lead. And then by the end of it, they're like, okay, we win, I guess. But, like, this has been embarrassing. Right. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, Central Michigan loses the game after, like, the massive comeback. Everyone that bet on the game is, I mean, I guess if you're the guys that, like, bet on Central Michigan versus the spread, you're just, like, ecstatic. But, right. like, if, I mean, if you bet on Western Kentucky, it's, like, the most devastating loss of your life. Exactly. What, what I don't know why you're yeah. betting on Western Kentucky, but whatever. I have no idea. <laughs> but there are degenerates. <laughs> That's true. What I'm kind well, of wondering about this game is a few things. It's just, like, what's happening in the stands, Right. A, are, have people like left the game when it's like a 35 point lead at the end of the third quarter? B, the people that have stayed there, are they so drunk that like they don't even know what's happening because this is what you do at the Bahamas Bowl? And like C, the native people from the Bahamas, how much of this do they even understand? Okay, so I will say this stadium seats 15,000, but some of the like reviews that I found said there were no more than 2,000 people there. Oh my God. But more specifically, and this is from 2017. So this is a different game, but it's the same Bahamas Bowl. And this is what really sparked my love for the Bahamas Bowl was this review that was left on Reddit. My family, every year around Christmas, when the Bahamas Bowl comes back on, we reread this Reddit review out loud to whoever we are with because we have to share the magic that is the Bahamas Bowl. Beautiful tradition. There's nothing better. So the review on Reddit. And you can go read the entire review. I'm not going to read it word for word, but I'm going to read some of the highlights from it about the 2017 game. This came from SuperMav27, who has a Wake Forest logo by his name on Reddit. So I'm not really sure why he went to this game, which was an Ohio UAB game in 2017. But the highlights he listed, first of all, he titled it, I'm currently at the Bahamas Bowl, and I'm here to tell you why it's the best thing to ever happen to college football. (laughs) So his highlights... Quote, brought beer right into the stadium. And then one of the locals standing at the gate just took a sip of his beer and just like let him in. At one point, his group ended up in the Ohio locker room after the Royal Bahamas Defense Force guard said that they could walk behind a random fence that was there. And they asked like what was behind it. And he said, I don't know, go check. And it ended up being the Ohio locker room. People were on the track because, like I said, it's a track stadium. So people are down on the track high-fiving security and players with beers in their hands. Can you imagine this happening at, like, the Sugar Bowl? Like, it just would never happen. (laughs) Um, To your point about what are the natives doing, this is a direct quote I'm going to read because I can't summarize it better than he said it. Quote, there's a native family in front of me literally braiding each other's hair. They told me they have no clue about how football works. They just want to have a good time. One of them offered to braid my hair. My hair is three inches long. (laughs) (laughs) A couple of other recap items. There were 20 stadium entrances and only 10 were actually guarded. This other guy responded to this Reddit feed and was like, everything that this guy's saying is true. The guy that responded is apparently the brother of an Ohio player. And apparently they didn't have tickets before they got to the game. So they went to will call to get them and the line was long. So instead they walked up to a gate holding what the guy said was, he said, holding beers and a bag of six other Bud Lights. And we told them, quote, we've already been in and they just let us in without checking anything else. (laughs) This man that commented added, there is archery in the stadium as well. So after you get your license renewed, you can go, I don't even know what the like verb for archery is. Do you know? You can arch. I have no idea. <laughs> is that, he said that all of the OU players on the sidelines were wearing sunglasses and bucket hats during the game. <laughs> and then the original post to wrap this all up said, for these reasons, I urge that the playoff committee consider hosting the national championship here. It would be a terrible idea, but everyone would have a great time. So I would like to plug that. I think that we should have the national title there. Connor, I'm curious, if we did have the national title there, who do you think would be the two best teams to be playing in it to have the best time? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Immediately comes to mind UConn. (laughs) Why? (laughs) Just the idea of UConn playing in a national championship is the funniest thing I can imagine. Well, yes, but (laughs) (laughs) 
that's anywhere. Who do you think would have the most fun in the Bahamas? I'm thinking like, what if like Lane Kiffin's down there? Yes, just wherever. Ole Miss. He'll be at a different um, Just perpetually, we'll call it the Lane Kiffin Bowl, actually. Yeah, like yeah. Championship idea and just make it wherever Lane Kiffin is, his team plays in the Bahamas Bowl. That's a good idea. Another, well, so this November, there's a game scheduled. It's Hugh Freeze against Lane Kiffin. So wow. it's Liberty Ole Miss. That could be a good national title. I'm trying to think of who else. Like LSU fans would have a blast in the Bahamas. I think really anyone would, but I would love to see the national title be played at at uh, Thomas Robinson Stadium, a gift from the Chinese government. <laughs> it's kind so, of yeah. That that's even a thing. I know. I don't know. It's, it's all just, so absurd. Just, okay. Yeah. I will say 2017 was the last year that Popeye sponsored the bowl. Then it became sponsored by Elk Grove Village, which is an industrial park outside of Chicago. Oh so yeah, this, I think sponsorships also open. I think. Yes. Okay. You can sponsor this bowl right now because the makers wanted the Bahamas bowl, which was the Elk Grove village sponsor gave up their rights to it in 2019. So we should step in and sponsor it. We should have Medill sponsor it. This seems. I don't even know if that's allowed. Why not? <laughs> well, actually, Slept on Sports should sponsor it. Well, sports should the Slept on Sports Bahamas Bowl. Well, we can go. We can go in on this. <laughs> we can yeah. make the fourth and four Slept on Sports Bahamas Bowl deal. Let's do it. Yeah, um, and we can make it um, announced by exclusively Medill alums. Oh yes, this is this this could be good. I'll do sideline. This Only is- because I want to walk around drinking beers, high-fiving players. And I feel like I could do that during – like, I can multitask. It, I could do it. <laughs> what I gather so, yes. the Bahamas Bowl is – it is not the most serious endeavor. Uh, no. And I want to say, like, when I learned about this yesterday, I was, like, in stitches. This is the most unbelievable game the 35 point blown lead by itself is enough for a slept on story. The fact that it's the Bahamas Bowl in a stadium gifted by the Chinese government, sponsored by Popeyes when there are no Popeyes, that by itself is enough for a slept on story. There are like so many things here that are just perfect slept on sports fodder, and they're all combined into one event, tradition. I don't even know what to describe it at this point. I I know that I might want to steal your family tradition of just reciting the 2017 Bahamas Bowl. Really, why why should it be limited to Christmas? I know it's a Christmas type of December, but I feel like anytime you're at a social gathering, you should just spread the word. I know. No, I agree. Do a dramatic reading. We need we need more people to be aware of this because as our good friend Super Mav 27 said. This is the best thing to ever happen to college football. Yes. There we have it. That is the history of the Bahamas Bowl that I hope you all tune into after hearing this. And go, go read the, the full post on Reddit. If you just Google like 20, 2017 Bahamas Bowl Reddit, it should pop up. Yeah, honestly, I read the main Reddit post and then I didn't read the comment section, which you've shared part of, which is incredible. I think everything associated with the Bahamas Bowl is so unique and so absurd and so just objectively hilarious that I'm just, I'm so happy to now know about it. There are also pictures on Twitter. If you go through the comments, like I'm looking at them now, there's a little girl. She looks like she's about like six, seven. She's wearing a JJ Watt Texans Jersey, which just is not, (laughs) is not related to the game. Also, one of the comments was like, I've seen DeMarcus Ware, Rob Gronkowski, Tom Brady and Cristiano Ronaldo jerseys at this game so like nobody even knows what no it is football football, ronaldo Ronaldo. yeah yeah Yeah, they're just all drunk braiding each other's hair having a great time which really that's what sports are about so cheers (laughs) cheers to just taking nothing seriously (laughs) yep exactly ashton thank you so much for joining me today on the slept on sports podcast I, i mean just just tremendous content. <laughs> Thank you for having me and allowing me to spread the word about one of my my favorite topics um, ever. So appreciate it. Thank yeah. you very much. This has been incredible, amazing. Check out Ashton and the whole crew on the Fourth and Four College Football Podcast. It's insanity, but you will actually learn things. That's how I will describe it. 
we try to do a balance of ridiculousness and then actual football stuff. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we probably overdo the football stuff in an effort not to be absurd, but sometimes we strike a perfect balance. And when we do, it's, it's fantastic content. So <laughs> highly recommend. Highly recommend. Yeah, thank you so much for joining me. This has been the Slept On Sports Podcast. This was my second episode doing a story about a pitcher, and then I'll finish my three-part kind of miniseries on pitchers next week. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review and share it with your friends. Again, I've been Connor Grohl with Ashton Pollard. And until next time, stay sleeping. Mm-hmm.